Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you to worship as we come in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ this morning to worship Him and God the Father and the Holy Spirit which is here amongst us. As we begin our service this morning, let us turn to our first lectionary reading. It's in Habakkuk chapter 1 verses 1 through 4 and chapter 2 verses 1 through 4. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw, O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not listen, or cry to your violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contentions arise. So the law became slack, and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. Then turning to the second uh, chapter of Habakkuk, I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what he will say to me and what he will answer concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me, and he said, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for the appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Look at the proud. Their spirit is not right in them. But the righteous, they live by faith. This time we'll have our second reading. I have the pleasure of reading from Isaiah chapter 1, verses uh, 10 through 18. In my, ver my Bible, it's titled, God's Case Against His Children. Jerusalem, your rulers are like those of Sodom, and your people are like those of Gomorrah. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to the teaching of our God. The Lord says, I do not want all these sacrifices. I have had enough of your burnt offerings of male sheep and fat from fine animals. I am not pleased by the blood of bulls, lambs, and goats. You come to meet with me, but you ask you, but, I, but who ask you to do all these running in and out of my temple's rooms? Don't continue bringing me worthless sacrifices. I hate the incense you burn. I can't stand your new moon, Sabbaths, and other feast days. I can't stand the evil you do in your holy meetings. I hate your new moon feast and your other yearly feast. They have become a heavy weight on me, and I am tired of carrying it. When you raise your arms to me in prayer, I will refuse to look at you. Even if you say many prayers, I will not listen to you because your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Stop doing the evil things I see you do. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Punish those who hurt others. Help the orphans. Stand up for the rights of widows. The Lord says, come, let us talk about these things. Through your, though your sins are like scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though your sins are deep red, they can be white as wool. The word of God for the people of God. Now we will have our Psalter. It's over on page 843. And we're, we're only using the verses uh, 137 through 144. That would be on page 843. And we will, re we will read responsively together. Righteous are you, O Lord, and right are your judgments. You have appointed your testimonies in righteousness and in all faithfulness. My zeal consumes me because my foes forgot your words. Your promise is well tried and your servant loves I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is righteous forever, and your law is true. 
Trouble and anguish have come upon me, but my commandments are my delight. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. I'm a little squeaky this morning, so pardon me. For announcements this morning, there's quite a few. Today, after morning worship, we're going to Gettys for lunch uh, in celebration of All Saints Day. If you'd like to go join us, please do so. Today at 3 o'clock is our charge conference at Vogel Day United Methodist Church. Our Christmas cantata practice is Wednesdays at 5.30 with Bible study at 6.00. Our Samaritan's Purse Operation Christmas Child Shoebox are due back next Sunday. We have a couple left. We've got a couple left. Been ready and there's some pamphlets on there talking about the kids that you can purchase stuff for and what they would like to have and what they can't have. 18th through the 20th, we'll be preparing our Thanksgiving baskets. We still have you still have time to donate food or money for the 15 food baskets. If you have any questions, see Ron Burchett. There are some other November activities listed there. You can read those. Our Kentucky East District Prayer Fellowship this month is the Wheelwright United Methodist Church, and we need to remember those in prayer. Let's remember our pastor in prayer. Last night, when you're taking steroids for sickness, you don't sleep very much. So you lay in bed and try to go to sleep, and you get things on your mind. And I got our pastor on my mind last night, and he's went through two very tough funerals this week people that he dearly loved. And sometimes we forget what he goes through and what he's there for. And we go to bed at night, we think about our family and we go to sleep, but he goes to bed at night or during the day and he has all our concerns on his heart every day. So let's remember our pastor, because I know Tuesday he was in that hospital room with Roger's family and he hurt just like they hurt because he loved Roger just like we all did. And the same thing with Cindy. When she was so ill, he was there with her family, supporting them, but he was hurting just as well as they were. So let's pray for our dear pastor and hold him up and lift him up and encourage him each and every day. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? No, we'll ask our pastor to come and lead us in prayer. Any unspoken prayer requests by the lift of your hand? All right. Yes. Bless your heart, sis. We will continue to hold up Brenda in prayer and the family. And uh, we know that uh, there's a couple places in our church this morning that is very empty uh, that we're used to seeing. So we're thankful. I know it was hard to be here today. But thank you. I'm glad the family are with you today and supporting you. Anybody else today? All right. If not, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father, we want to come before you today with our hearts that are both broken and rejoicing. Because, Lord, we know that even though, God, we have tears in our eye, there's also tears of joy because we have a promise of a better place. We have a promise of a land where there'll be no dying, there'll be no tears, where there'll be no sickness and disease. And we look forward to that day, God. 
But I pray, Father, that you would comfort hearts today and help those that are grieving and continue to grieve, Lord. And we all grieve in different ways. But Lord, I know you meet us where we are. You weep with those that weep. You go to us, Lord, when we need you the most, and you walk with us in our darkest times. And so I pray, Father, today for your blessings on each and every one here. Each of us, Lord, have our own battles. Each of us has our own cross to bear. And you help us with that load. And sometimes, Lord, we fall beneath the load because it's greater than we can bear. But then you say, Lord, for us to give the load to you and you will help us carry those burdens. So help us do that today, I pray. I pray for our church and I pray for our leaders and God in the direction that you'd have us go as we make decisions and we try to see our way through in times of darkness and times of difficulty. Guide us, Lord. We don't want to do anything without the aid of the Holy Spirit. So lead us in the way you'd have us go. And let us pray, Lord, as you taught your disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespass, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Can we have the children come up, please? All the kids come up. Come up and have a seat up here. Y'all can sit on the steps or the floor, wherever you want to sit. Got some more coming up. All right. Look at all the beautiful children. Did y'all go uh, trick-or-treating last night? Uh, I saw some of you. And what did you go as? You were, what did you dress up like? Okay. Oh, you don't know. You just. Okay. What about Lex? A hillbilly? Okay. So you just went like you were, or what? Just like... <laughs> All right. Parker, what did you dress up like? It? Harry Potter. Harry Potter. Yeah, he was a really cool Harry Potter, too. You remember what you were? A hillbilly? Okay. Slender. Man, okay, cool. Well, we we got a lot of kids at our house, and uh, some of you were there, and it was just a wonderful time. Uh, it's a time sometimes it can be uh, a little scary and all that, but uh, it's also a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun, in it, really. But have you ever been scared? Yeah, I get scared sometimes. Sometimes you get scared. You know what? What are some of the things you're afraid of? Anybody? Animals? Clowns. clowns. You're afraid of clowns. Okay. Anybody else afraid of clowns? What are you afraid of? Snakes. Snakes? Okay. Sometimes I'm afraid of spiders. Spiders? Yeah. Bruce is scared of spiders, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what else? Anything else? What? What are you afraid of? They had what? They had teeth and like scary teeth on the rail. They were trying to chase me. Oh my goodness! <laughs> that is scary. That wasn't Daddy, was it? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is that is very scary. I, oh man! I I tell you what. Sometimes I get scared too. And, you know, one of the things I, I do when I'm scared, like one time I was walking and uh, trying to go home, and I got, I got lost because I was in the woods. This was when I was real young. I haven't got lost in a long time. 
been a while. Uh, but uh, anyway, I, uh, I got lost and I got scared and I began to, uh, my brother was with me, so that gave me a little comfort, but we couldn't find our way back. And finally, it got dark and, and we heard, we got close and we heard our parents calling for us. We heard them hollering our name. And we just went toward the light and that's how we found our way home. And one time I was lost and I, I got scared and I just started praying and God helped me get through that. And so in the Bible it talks about being lost. It doesn't really mean that you're like lost in the woods, but that you don't know God. To be lost in the Bible means that you are away from God. And God, can, God wants you to have a relationship with Him and get close to Him by finding Him. So when you're scared or you feel afraid or lost, you can pray and Jesus will help you, okay? So let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for this day. I want to thank you for the love that you have for us, and I want to pray for these children. God, that you would comfort them when they're scared or when they feel lost or any time that they're confused. God, guide them and guard them, we pray. And then, Lord, as they grow up, may they grow up to be young men and women who will know and serve God, we pray. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Lily's not here. Is somebody taking her place or not? Do we have anybody? If I don't see anybody. No. So y'all go back and... T- okay. Uh, L- Leslie has volunteered to take the kills. Y'all follow Leslie. We have children's church now. Our sermon text is taken from the 19th chapter of Luke, beginning with the first verse. And Jesus entered and was passing through Jericho. And behold, there was a man called by the name of Zacchaeus. And he was a chief tax gatherer, and he was rich. And he was trying to see who Jesus was. And he was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. And he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. And when they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be a guest of the man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will give back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Let's pray. Father, we pray that we might feel the need to seek Jesus, that we would strive to be in places and circumstances that we would be near to Jesus, that we might share this with others in our community. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Today I want to start with a very uh, theological and perplexing question. and. You saw, if you saw the bulletin in, on the board, you know what it is. How tall was Jesus? Anybody want to guess? Okay. Okay. You can't, can't, Google can't go wrong, right? Uh, well, It's a good question because uh, in the Bible there's only maybe one or two places where it even talks about Jesus' height. Uh, One, of course, when he was growing up, it says that he grew in wisdom and stature. But it doesn't say at that point how tall he was. But then we come to this passage today that Ron just read. And there's one verse there that you could make an argument and say that Jesus was short because it says 
depending on how you translate it, that Zacchaeus came and wanted to see Jesus, but could not because he was short, he being Jesus. So he climbed up into a tree to be able to see little Jesus. Now, wait a minute. That just goes against everything you've been taught, right? That's, that's, uh, that's like all the Sunday school teachings and Bible school and all the preaching you ever heard was Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, and he climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see, right? That's what we've always heard. What they probably didn't tell you was that in the original Greek, it can be translated either way. It can be translated that Zacchaeus, because of the crowd, that he could not, because he, Zacchaeus, was small, could not see Jesus. Or it can be translated, actually, that because of the crowd, he, Jesus, was so small that Zacchaeus couldn't see him, so he had to climb in a tree to be able to see him. It can be translated either way. And since I'm doing the sermon today, I'm going to make a call. He, Jesus was short. Five, five, according to Adam. I, I didn't know that. But anyway, uh, it's, <clears throat> if that's not enough for you, understand this, that in the early Christian church, they were people who ridiculed the disciples for saying Jesus was the Messiah, simply because the Messiah would never be as short as Jesus was. And so... Jesus was probably short, probably as short as John Wesley or Napoleon. And we have this picture here of a man who comes in either way. Uh, we, we have a picture here of, of Zacchaeus who wants to get a look at Jesus, but because of the crowd, and depending on the translation, uh, you, you can kind of, <clears throat> it can kind of get confusion, but he was not able to see him. And so he climbs up into a tree. And Zacchaeus was not <clears throat> just a tax collector, which was, you know, they were despised in those days. He was a chief tax collector, which means he was the head of the tax collectors. He was one who worked for the government, took advantage, uh, supposedly, of people, and was very despised in society. And that is the very person that Jesus went to have dinner with. The only person that he went to have dinner with in Jericho. Jesus, of all people, chose to go the home of Zacchaeus. But not only that, but Zacchaeus was a rich man. He was very rich. And Luke, if you read Luke, Luke is not very nice to rich people. Most of the time he's saying things against rich people... But in this passage, it's a little different. It shows that Jesus is going to the home of a rich person. I think it's interesting that when we, have, uh, when we talk about sending missionaries to other countries and other places, we almost always send them and talk about going to places of the poorest of the poor. And the Bible does say a lot about helping the poor. But why is it that we never send missionaries to Hollywood? Why is it that we never send missionaries to places where people are rich and have wealth? They need Jesus too, don't they? Why is it, Jesus said that there would be a temptation for those that are rich and it's easier for someone to go through the eye of a needle, you know, than a rich person to make it to heaven, but still there was Jesus going to a rich person's house. And we might be tempted to say, as they were, what is Jesus doing? Why is Jesus spending time with this sinner? In Luke chapter 15, in case they forgot, Jesus will remind them of the stories that he told in Luke 15. He told about going and this fellow trying to save a dumb sheep that was lost. And he also talked about a worthless penny that someone tried to find. And he talked about a sinful young boy, a prodigal son. And then he turned to them and said, I didn't come to call the righteous. I come to call the sinner. And here in this place they accuse him. There they accuse him of hanging out with sinners. And in this one they say, here is Jesus who is a guest of a sinner. Now it was a big deal in those days to be someone's guest. 
Because they, when someone took you in the Jewish culture under their roof, they were doing so and by saying, I'm going to protect you, and you're important to me, and I'm important to you. We're going to sit at a table. And in the Jewish culture, when you sat at someone's table, it meant that you were friends. And so that was a big deal. They're saying, wait a minute. This Jesus is being a guest of a rich rascal. A Pharisee, uh, really a, a tax collector who has taken advantage of so many people. And then Jesus does something amazing. He looks at them and says, after he says, I, I come not to call the righteous, and I, uh, he says, Zacchaeus, today salvation has come to your house. Wait a minute. Two things there. First of all, he calls Zacchaeus lost. He said, I didn't come to call the righteous, but I come to, to seek and save that which is lost. Right off the bat, that might be a little strange for someone to hear to say, wait a minute, who said I was lost? Lost is a pretty strong word to use, isn't it? I mean, maybe I've misappropriated funds a couple times, or maybe I've done people wrong, but lost? I, I'm rich. I'm, I'm uh, honored and I'm all these things. But lost? That's a little overstatement, is it? But no, that's the, co the, to the coin, the, the term that Jesus used, lost. Now, second thing he says, today is salvation come to your house. And I thought it was interesting that Jesus said, I'm going to go to your house today. I'm going to have supper at your house. And, you know, he invited himself. Zacchaeus didn't say, oh, why don't you come over and, you know, when it's convenient, we'll have dinner. No, nope. Jesus does it. Now, how, how would you like that today if, as I, as your pastor, just said, by the way, I'm coming to your house today for dinner. Some of you might say, well, I won't be there, or uh, you bring your own dinner or whatever, you know. But if I invited myself and said, I'm coming to your house for dinner, some of you might not like that. But that's exactly what Jesus did. He invited himself, and you know, Based on this, I want, to, I want to give you a definition of salvation. Salvation is when Jesus invades your space and sits at your table for a love feast and a salvation feast. When Jesus goes to the sinner and says, I am going to be with you and I'm going to fellowship with you, that's salvation. And he sits down at the worst of the worst. Remember this, that Jesus, when he had the, uh, the feast, the Last Supper, and sat around that table with his friends, one of those was Judas. One of those that he knew would betray him. He still sat with him. And they would say, oh, he goes to, he's a friend of sinners, and he eats with sinners, and he's a guest of this worst sinner here. But Jesus said, today salvation has come to your house. You know, oftentimes in the Bible, in the New Testament, Jesus was not always invited. He came and he offered himself to people who didn't even ask. And that's kind of the way Jesus was known to do and still does today. Bible, the Bible says, <coughs> he said, you didn't choose me, but I have chosen you. God is looking for you. We are the lost sheep. We don't even have enough sense sometimes to know that we need God. And yet he's out there looking for us. And he's walking the hills searching for the one lost sheep. And that's exactly why they hated Jesus. They hated Jesus because he went to the rich. And because he hung out with the sinners. And he was with the disgusted and the poor and the rich. And that's one of the reasons they crucified him. That was the condensation of Jesus. How tall was Jesus? Well, he was small enough to reach down and grab the lowest of the low. The old song we used to sing, when he reached way down for me, he reached way down for me. I was lost and undone without God and his son, but he reached down his hand for me. Garth Brooks said, I've got friends in low places. Well, Jesus does too, I'll just tell you. He's got some friends in low places, and I'm one of them. Thank God that he left heaven. And he didn't say, I don't want that old worthless piece of dirt that nobody else has nothing to do. Thank God he looked at me and said, I'm going to save you regardless of yourself. 
I'm going to save you even though nobody expects me to do it. And some of the greatest surprises of heaven will be when you and I stand there and people will say, boy, I didn't think you'd make it. And I'd say, oh, I didn't think you would either, but, you know, <laughs> that's going to be wonderful. That's going to be wonderful because I know God loves more than we could even imagine. Aren't you glad that you're not the judge and I'm not the judge? Because there's a lot of people I wouldn't let in. There's some people I probably wouldn't let in. Aren't you glad that today that we stand before God and we stand before Him and today we know that He is the God of all creation and He's the one we stand before? Yes. And He says today salvation has come to your house. What does it mean to be lost? I'm trying to explain that to the children. That's not easy. It's not easy now. You know, I remember being a child and my mom standing up in church and prayer requests and saying, pray for my husband, he's lost. And I just thought he was out there in the woods somewhere. I didn't know what she was talking about. But I, I understand a little bit more now. A fellow said one time, uh, he was a farmer, and said, you know, how did your cow get lost? And he said, well, it just eats a little tuff of grass and eats that and moves on to the next tuff of grass and maybe finds a weak spot in the fence or a loose spot and goes to the next tuff of grass. Before you know it, he's wandered so far, he's... He's lost. Sometimes that's what happens to us. We just wander so far away from God. Before we realize it, we're completely out of God's will. We don't even know how it happened. We're just kind of like that. I used to ha uh, have a pet raccoon, uh, raccoon when I was growing up. And they don't make the best pets. I was, uh, they, after a certain age, they, they kind of change a little bit. And they're not, uh, they're not really good to have as pets because they will bite you hard, and it will bring blood. And they did. And uh, I finally took that pet to the stockyard and sold it to the first person who would give me anything for it. But pet raccoons, I was, I was reading about this guy who was a zookeeper, and he saw this little girl, Julie, who had a pet raccoon. He, and he told her about the dangers of raccoons and how they change and things. And she said, oh, no. Charlie won't bite me. He loves me. He would never do that to me. And then later on, uh, Julie had to have plastic surgery because this pet had, went, had disfigured her face so much. True story. But I, thought, I tell that to say this today, that we sometimes play with sin to the same way, that we feel like that there's no big deal, that it won't affect us and it won't hurt us. And, and I can tell you, I, I talked to a lady the other day when, you know, that, that had had an accident car wreck, doctor gave her uh, some pain pills, the next thing you know she's hooked on pills and her life is a mess and she's destroyed her life. It happens. But none of us think that. I, I, I preach that message and I, I repeat today the three things that sin does. Let's see, see if you can remember these. First of all, sin will take you farther than you want to go. Secondly, sin will keep you longer than you want to stay. And third, Sin will cost you more than you want to pay. It's real and it's serious. And sometimes we, we think, well, I'll just, I'll do this for a little while, but it gets a hold of us and it destroys us. And that's why we need Jesus. Because he redeems us and he buys us back. And we all need Jesus. Jesus wants to come to our house today. And he don't care who we are or what we've done. He wants to dine with us today, and he wants to abide. We're going to have communion a little bit and have communion and d dine with Jesus. But would you say yes to Jesus today? You know, sometimes we let all kinds of things get in our way and cause us to be confused, and sometimes the worst thing that can happen to us is religion. Because we get caught up in what everybody else thinks and what everybody else thinks we ought to do. And I've seen the biggest thing that caused Jesus problem. You know who it was that objected to Jesus going to the house of this rich man? It wasn't the sinner. It wasn't. It was the religious people. And most of the trouble I have when I'm visiting at the hospital or a pastor, most of the trouble I find is not the sinner it's the religious people because they're so caught up in their own doctrine and religion that they have no room for Jesus. Let's just throw all that out. Somebody said one time, I used to be a Baptist, and they're like, how can you preach in a Methodist church when you were a Baptist? And I said, well, 
I preach the same Jesus I preached back then. He hasn't changed. He's the same today, yesterday, and forever. And so today, Jesus wants to come to your house and want to invite the musicians to come up at this time. And today, the invitation is for you. None of us are perfect. But yet, God wants to have a relationship with us, and He wants us to make a commitment to Him and say, I want to follow you. I want to live for you. And I invite you to do that today. As we sing, we're going to give you an opportunity to come forward. And you don't have to come up here to be saved. I know that. Or even to get right with God. Maybe, you've, maybe you're like the, the cow that wandered away. from the. You just need to come back home. But what this does, it lets everyone know that you're serious, that you need prayer today. Whatever it is, you can come up and shake your hand and go right back if you want. By that, the people will know that you're wanting us to pray for you. Now, I don't embarrass anybody. Don't call your name out. But if you want to come up and just, be, just ask to let this church know you want to be prayed for while we sing, we invite you to come.